Okay, so this is episode 35, interview with Dean Somerset, who is a exercise physiologist and medical exercise specialist and kinesiologist. So it was a fantastic interview. Good news is some really good insights, especially if you've ever struggled with injury in your training. The bad news is that we were piloting this new call recording video software and it's ended up catching Dean's face in the centre, luckily, but myself and Johnny were stood side by side and it's only caught half of our faces. Luckily, the reason you came, really, admit it, is to get the nice close-up view of the sexy Canadian. So enjoy, catch the show notes in the link in the description below. Ching. And positions in the main lifts. It'd be good. It'd be good to talk about um, side planks. <laughs> yeah. Johnny Just... loves side planks. <laughs> I think, so I, I used to have like massive hip issues, and a guy who does ART, yeah. who's friends with Rich Knight, tipped me off onto your stuff. Um, so that's that's helped me a lot. But I think it's something from speaking to other people. It's something that you're quite well known for. I imagine you know that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I've written a lot about that, so yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely my wheelhouse. We can touch on that if you want. Cool, awesome. Okay, All right. <clears throat> over to you. Lovely. So, hello everyone. Welcome to Propane Fitness Podcast, episode thirty-five. We are honoured today to be with Dean Somerset, who is a kinesiologist, exercise physiologist, and medical exercise specialist. Hey, Dean. How's it going, guys? Very good. So, could you just introduce yourself for our listeners? I think you did a great job right there. I mean, um, I get all the fancy titles at the end of my name. Pretty much, that just means I'm a personal trainer. I get paid to count reps and make people get all jacked and swollen, awesome, and stuff like that. And, um, most of my clientele come from medical referrals or post-surgical, and I do get the odd client coming in who's an elite athlete. I've got a couple of uh, Olympic gold medalists I'm working with. One guy is getting ready for a Rio. Um, a couple of pro hockey teams and pro hockey players and amateur guys, but uh, typically most of my clientele are at either end of the spectrum. They're either really broken or need significant help to get them back into a functional state, or they're in elite athlete in performance mode. So that's typically who I tend to work with. And I work at a commercial facility in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And in the winters, it gets down to minus 40. So all I have the chance to do is work out in my basement and study. That's about it. So that's quite that's quite cold then. Yeah, there was a, a point a couple of years ago where I saw a new study where it was uh, colder in Edmonton than it was on Mars. So that, wow. that kind of made me examine why they wanted to live here. <laughs> uh, then I realized going into any of the major cities, housing is a big issue. Like the size of a house that I have now would be in the, the millions and millions of pounds, probably over in London. I was in, I was there just a little while ago, and it's always fun to kind of walk around London and look at like real estate boards and see what places are going for. And I just shake my head and think I can't even afford close to that. And then I come home and it's like, all right, I got it. Gym in my basement. I got three bedrooms. I'm doing okay. Yeah, like a, a studio flat in London. I think you're looking at a million pounds, which is yeah. insane. Absolutely insane. No. So you, yeah, you'll be good I, then if if and when we all migrate to Mars. You'll be uh, you'll be sorted. I'll be ready for it. I mean, I'll be ready for that. I mean, I don't like flying, so I don't know how interstellar <laughs> travel would be. But I'm sure there'll be slightly more tur- uh, turbulence on that flight than there is on the British Airways going from Edmonton to oh. London, but. Probably well, once, once you get there, you'll be you'll be pretty comfortable, be, yeah, well trained. Sort of. that's, that's a part everyone else will struggle with. <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. is that all? Is it, are all your clients in person, Dean, or do you do some online stuff as well? I do some online stuff as well. I've got about eighteen, I think eighteen or nineteen distance coaching clients that I work with right now. Um, plus, I have uh, an online training resource that I put out last November called High Tensile Strength, which is just a training program that people can access and. It's a six-month training program that people can go through that's kind of the closest thing to training with me without actually training with me. So that way if somebody's kind of just gun shy, they don't want to communicate that much or they don't have the money or resources for it, it gives them options to be able to go for it. If somebody wants to travel to the frozen tundra in Edmonton, we can rock out some deadlifts, but if they don't, there's other options available too. Awesome. Okay. So it sounds like you've worked with quite a, a wide variety of people. What, yeah. across that population would you say are the most common dysfunctions that you see? Um, the big thing I, I think that uh, our industry has to kind of get away from the concept of is the idea of a dysfunction. 
in and of itself. Like if somebody has like a forward head posture or rolled shoulders, we could say that that's a dysfunction based on what we know about anatomy in terms of what the normal function of the body is. But then we also have to think, well, maybe that's a positive adaptation of what they're doing right now. So you get an office worker who sits on an office chair for 40 or 50 hours a week for 50 weeks a year. That's actually a positive adaptation to help them see the screen easier and help them hold that position. So is that a dysfunction? Yeah, depending on how you're looking at it, it might be a dysfunction in terms of you know, getting your arms up over your head. But again, a 50-year-old office worker doesn't necessarily need to excel at that. They need to excel at being able to sit in a chair and be able to stare at a computer screen. So in terms of uh, common dysfunctions, I don't think that there's necessarily one that stands up the most. I mean, we get a lot of adaptations from people that are sitting in office chairs quite a bit. And then if they want to try to regain lost motion, that's kind of the biggest dysfunction when people don't have the motion anymore because they've not worked on that specific motion that they want to use, whether it's scapular retraction, depression, whatever. But um, the body is amazingly adaptable to what we put it into, and it's going to adapt in the ways we want to see it. So those adaptations are, are going to be positive in one direction and negative in another direction all the time. If you get somebody stronger quads, that's fantastic, but they might also lose range of motion at their knee, or they might lose range of motion at their hip. So it's always going to be that cost of doing business. When you have a positive adaptation in one direction, it's going to take something away from another direction. So the adaptations are kind of specific to what somebody's doing, and as you said, it's it's positive if it's if it's for improving that thing. So um, a lot of people listening probably work desk jobs. I know we do ourselves. Um, how how important is daily posture in terms of mitigating any kind of um, painful effects on training? For example, if somebody's sat at a desk for several hours and then um, in the evenings goes to goes to lift weights. Yeah, you know, the funny thing is looking at a lot of the research on posture, and there, there's very little coming out now that shows direct connections and causation between posture and pain incidents. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of correlative studies that have been done and connect the dots kind of things, but very few studies have looked at when a person has that forward head posture, thoracic kyphosis, that big upper back running, that that actually directly relates to a higher incidence of pain development. I mean, we all know somebody who has probably sat in what we would call horrendous posture or terrible posture, but they've done that their entire life, and we look at them and say, you know, why are you not hurting? How can this not be a problem for you? But they just get through it. Like I said, it could be a positive adaptation or in the presence of maybe it's something that does create pain or maybe it does create an issue with something, and maybe it's a negative adaptation or it's beyond what their body's tolerances are. In terms of daily posture, I think it's important to have a well-rounded approach to posture and not really force one direction over another. But in terms of does it actually create pain or does it not create pain, not much of the research out there is pointing to saying, yes, when you have that rounded shoulders, you will have neck and back pain. You might have tight muscles, but that's different than pain. So I've had a lot of people that I've worked with where they come in and they have those rounded shoulders and I look at them and I think, okay, well, that's there for a reason. Why am I going to change it if it's not creating a problem for that individual? Could we actually work muscles and get them into a better position to work those muscles? Absolutely. You got somebody who's got that rounded shoulders, it becomes really difficult to retract and compress your shoulder blades. So doing things like a rowing exercise becomes challenging until you get them into more of that thoracic extension position where they can actually take advantage of the shoulder blades. But until then, it's a matter of, okay, what are you going to do with it? What are you not going to do with it? In terms of how somebody moves, there's a more efficient way, a more beneficial way. There's a less efficient way. There's a less beneficial way. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to directly relate to creating or reducing pain. So do you think there's any merit to just telling people to just sit up straight? Because I, I often think if, if there is any kind of uh, disruption in length tension relationship when someone's sat uh, or they've adapted mm -hmm. to a certain way, then just trying to actively maintain a, a different posture, is that addressing the root of the problem? Um, I don't know. I mean, if you address a length, a length tension relationship at any point in time, I mean the person's going to get used to what they have to get used to. So it could just be a situation where they've adapted to that position well, and if they've adapted to it well, then it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to mitigate creating a problem. Now, you can have some people where the amount of force on the body is exceeding what their body's ability to handle is, and that's where you can start getting into like tension issues, and that's where you can start getting into injuries and stuff like that. But um, in terms of just like daily posture, it doesn't seem to pan out that well that somebody's basic posture would cause pain or would cause problems. I mean, you could say that, oh, yeah, there is probably an increased likelihood of it, 
but it doesn't seem to be that connected directly. So it's quite it's quite trendy to think that sitting is the new smoking. Is that something that yeah. do you do you think that sitting for long periods of time, you know, taking posture out of the equation, just being in a seated position, is that detrimental to, you know, is that creating pain or is it detrimental to performance? Well, it's definitely going to be detrimental to performance <clears throat> if the person has to get up and around. I mean, for me, if I sit for a half hour or twenty minutes or whatever. And then I stand up, my hips tend to take about five or ten steps to loosen up and move around again. But I think it's a matter of like the society that we live in, a lot of people do have office jobs, a lot of people do have desk jobs. So when you say sitting is the new smoking, well, what is, what is that going to actually do? Is, are people going to now all of a sudden en masse quit their jobs and start becoming personal <laughs> trainers or working in road work or something like that? And it doesn't really produce an effect in terms of, okay, well, sitting is the new smoking, how do we get people to stop sitting? Well, you're really not going to get people to stop sitting based on the fact that it's so indoctrinated in our society. But what we can do is instead of saying, you know, sitting is the new smoking, we could say, you know, if you don't move a lot or if you don't have a lot of variety in your life in terms of how you're moving, well, maybe add a little bit more variety in your life. So get people up and moving around in their office breaks or get people to work out on a regular basis during the day and just make sure that they're either commuting to work in an active manner or doing something actively after work or during work. Rather than saying, you know, sitting is the new smoking, we could start saying, well, let's start adding more variety and more movement to the rest of your life. If you have to sit, you have to sit. I'm not going to tell someone that they shouldn't sit because that's their job, but if we can get them moving for 20 or 40 or 60 minutes a day, that will tend to counteract a lot of the effects of sitting for the rest of the day. I mean, a lot of people will do the math and say, oh, well, an hour of exercise doesn't equate to eight hours of sitting in a chair. Well, Directly, no, but I wager dollars to donuts that if you moved an hour a day, you'd be in way better shape than if you didn't move for an hour a day. As opposed to just, like, making people feel guilty for sitting, but no change to their behavior. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm a big believer in positivity, no matter what we're talking about. So um, when we start talking about things like movement dysfunction, that's got a real negative term, terminology to it. The person might have walked into the gym and thought, oh, well, I'm just going to go in and see if I can get fit. And all of a sudden, they meet with the trainer and tells them they have 50 million things wrong with them. And then they leave feeling like a bag of crap. <laughs> okay, well, let's get you to actually feel good about yourself. You want to get in better shape? Cool. Here's some ways that we can do it. You want to move better? Cool. Here's some ways we can do it. You have a, a sore shoulder? That's fine. Let's see if we can get you to still train without causing your shoulder to get any more sore or get into a worse position. So there's always ways that we can reword and reframe what we're talking about in a, a more positive manner that makes people actually get excited to do stuff That's rather really than depriving them into a depression state kind of thing. Yeah, I, I like that a lot rather than just throwing diagnoses at people and and telling them yeah. they're, they're just wrong as people. Um, I think it's just one of those things, isn't it? You know, as as any um, you know, media co- catches on to some idea that's fairly common fairly embedded in society and suddenly tells everyone that it's killing us and so you know when you you have a a nation of people who aren't necessarily well versed in these ideas it's i think it's sometimes you know it's certainly convincing i think the idea of sitting down all day it certainly doesn't make you feel um like athletic like yeah yeah. it makes you feel quite sluggish and makes you feel quite stiff and tight and tight back tight hips so it's certainly you can see the line of thinking with the argument, but but yeah, I agree. Doing something variety of movements definitely better than saying right. I have to sit one hour of exercise won't do anything, so I'll just stay sitting instead. Yeah, but uh, the thing a lot of people don't realize is let's take a look at some of the most elite athletes in the world. In the time that they're not training or practicing, what do you think they're doing? They're probably just sitting. They're traveling. They're on a plane, they're on a bus, they're in the back of a plane, and they're living in probably horrendous conditions if they're not in a professional state. So when they're doing a lot of their traveling or when they're doing a lot of their non-competitive or non-practice-based stuff, they're probably sitting just as much as the guy in the office chair. The only difference is when they strap on the field, they're ready to go and they have a different ability on the field to be able to get things moving. So when we look at elite athletes, they don't sit any less than the average person. They probably actually sit more because they're spending so much time just being go, go, go when they're on the field, and then they just rest and recover afterwards. You took look at any group of pro athletes and ask them how much time do you spend playing video games, it's probably a lot. <laughs> so moving on to you know, your average strength training you know, gym enthusiast, what mm-hmm. sort of mistakes would you see either you know, in the training itself or in prep or just general lifestyle? Um, some of the biggest mistakes I would say is just 
jumping into it too quickly before you kind of warm your body up. I mean, for a lot of the people in our gym, we've kind of indoctrinated the concept that, you know, do a little bit of a warm up, do a couple minutes of foam rolling, do some stretching, and then go and do whatever you want to do. So a lot of the people when they come into the gym, they actually go through a bit of a sequence, even if they're not training with their trainer. Um, they've seen the people working out enough that they're like, okay, I want to kind of steal what these guys are doing over here. We're happy to help everyone that we possibly can without feeling combative or competitive or over it or anything like that. But, I mean, if we can get somebody to, instead of walking into the gym cold and then growing and grabbing the barbell and starting to try to do back squats, get them to do just a couple of minutes of movement prep to get ready for it, especially if it's at the end of the day after they've been sitting all day, just to kind of prepare them up for the body. I think that would be the, the best thing that they could work with. And then from there, being willing to adjust things on the fly. I mean, there's a lot of people that will get into the mindset of this is my set program and I do this all the time. But they don't necessarily think, okay, well, maybe I need to adjust the weight here or there. Maybe I need to adjust the range of motion. Maybe I need to adjust how I'm doing the exercise. So being willing to play around with things a little bit more. Everyone tends to, especially people that don't have as deep of a mindset of knowledge base in fitness, they tend to think it's a very strict a uh, very strict, structured, rigid, regimental type of thing where you have to do these exercises this way. And I'll tell my clients all the time, you know, if you do it 50% right and then play with the other 50%, you're probably going to be better off. So I'll give them basic exercises that I want them to work with and then I'll encourage them to kind of explore ranges of motion and encourage them to try different ways of things. So that way they become more independent with their workouts too. So yeah, I think that there is a lot of dogmatism with like you must squat or you're a pussy and all this stuff. And I, I wonder whether if someone can't achieve the the range of motion to be able to do that safely, then you <clears throat> you're just putting them at risk and potentially turning them off training for for longer. So yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, um, absolutely. Actually, on that note, uh, a workshop that Tony and I teach, complete shoulder and hip. One of the big concepts we hammer home is the concept of that individuality, like we're talking about. Like, some people just literally do not have the hip structure to squat below parallel. And we make the point, who actually has to squat below parallel? Powerlifters. Aside from that, they're the only ones that have to squat below parallel. Olympic lifters don't have to squat below parallel. They just have to lift a bar up off the floor. If they squat deep, great. It means they don't have to get the bar as high to make the catch. But aside from that, like you get Joe from accounting who's 50 years old and just wants to be able to play with his grandkids, and you tell him he's a pussy for not squatting ass to grass, and he keeps trying to do it, and he winds up with a back issue or a hip issue or something like that. Well, you didn't really do much service to that client. Yeah, it's, it's just fitness bravado, I suppose, isn't it? But um, So some, something else that you mentioned about sort of getting, getting things loosened up before you actually come in and train, there's a video that I saw from you uh, of it was the hip mobility movement sequence, which I absolutely loved. Um, I will we'll stick a link to that in the description below. Um, that's Dean just going through some sort of coordination and, and mobilization uh, for the hips. And it's, it's a nice kind of active sequence that you can do before squatting and deadlifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, getting people to move. I mean, one thing we tend to forget about is that the hip is a three-dimensional joint. It's a ball and socket joint. So when we start taking that ball and socket, we start thinking, okay, I'm just going to go sagittal plane or I'm just going to go rotation through internal external rotation, I'm just going to go frontal plane stuff. We forget that it's a circular joint, so we have to kind of take more of a circular approach with things and get it to move through all directions that we possibly can and feel what it feels like at the end range and be able to kind of adjust on the fly as you need to. If people would take time to just spend like five minutes to move a joint around before they actually loaded it up, I think the world would be a more beautiful place. The sun would shine brighter, the birds would chirp a little harder, the grass would be greener. <laughs> Yeah, all that good stuff. So what take us through, Dean, what what does an average warm up look like for, you know, one of your clients? You don't have to be too specific, but just gem generally what do you have them go through? Um, it depends on the client. Like if I have someone who's just training for general fitness and they only come in to see me once a week or twice a week, uh, we might just do a very quick cardio warm up for a couple of minutes just to get the heart rate up. Foam roll for a couple of minutes just to do kind of like a self analysis on what their body's doing, what feels tight, what doesn't feel tight. Then we'll do just some basic mobility work with hips, with shoulders, with thoracic spine. If I have somebody who's coming in um, with a specific injury, like a, a shoulder issue or a knee issue or a back issue, we'll definitely spend a lot more time working on mobility and control through that area. And then we'll dial up strength training aspects until we get to a point where they feel like they're getting challenged with it. Um, for some of the athletes, we'll go through like a very general mobility and we'll go through a specific mobility based on what their sport is and what their activities are, what the goals are for that session. But for a lot of the clientele, it's going to be maybe five or ten minutes of movement prep. Um, I see a lot of people who will do like a half-hour warm-up, 
which is fantastic if they need it, but for most people, they probably don't, especially if they're not training at elite levels and they're not very banged up. Like if you're in the mindset that you're banged up, but you're not really that banged up, you spend a half hour doing your warm up, and then you're so tired by the time you're done your warm up, you forget to train, that might be <laughs> counterproductive to what you're actually trying to do. So that's something I think we've seen quite a lot with people who, like, I guess they, they self diagnose from seeing lots of, you know, overdose of mobility stuff online and start to think that they've got so many issues that, yeah, the actual training suffers because they're constantly trying to fix themselves. Yeah. I mean, even with my own training for warm ups and movement prep, I might spend five or 10 minutes on it. And that's it. I mean, I've been lifting for 20 years, I've got my own list of injuries and mechanical things that are going on. So at, at that point, it's a matter of, okay, well, what needs to be addressed for this workout today? Do I need to spend a half hour of uh, breathing into a balloon with my feet against the walls to be able to deadlift? <laughs> Probably not. I, I mean, I, I do see value in doing stuff like that, but I also see that it can be counterproductive to uh, some people, especially if they don't necessarily need that direction of training. So for me, I'll do just range of motion stuff with the hips, do some high tension drills at either end of the spectrum through flexion or extension, and then work on saying, okay, how do they feel today? From that, I'm able to determine, okay, do I go heavy today? Do I not go heavy? How do I feel? What do I feel like doing? Throw some weight on the bar, see how it feels, and then reassess at that point. Do I feel like going heavier? Does it feel junky? Throw more weight on the bar, see how it feels, and just keep going that way. So, so we'll pick the high yield stuff. I mean, you, you've you've got other things to do than just be breathing into a balloon all day. So, yeah, I suppose uh, yeah, you just exactly. pick the high yield stuff and then just gauge it by how the warm-ups feel and then take it from there with the training. I wonder how many people are going to try putting their feet against the wall and breathing into the balloon. I'm, I'm going to go do it straight yeah, after it's, this. It's tempting, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> you do at a party on a Saturday night, <laughs> like you start clearing the dance floor and start breathing in the balloon. I mean, Everyone. nothing is as sexier than breathing in the middle of the club. It's going to get dropped like it's hot when stuff like that happens. It's going to be great. Just get everyone to start doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the new whip in an AA. That's going to be So you've got a video... Um, that helped me a lot about uh, side planks and hip mobility. Is yeah. that, well, I suppose maybe I'll let you explain a little bit about that. So I think you're, you're quite well known um, for that specific suggestion. So do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, why side planks help with hip mobility first? Well, it's great that I'm known for that. I wish I was known for being a dead sexy Canadian beast, but uh, <laughs> well, I, I that's not too, that too. That, that's just, just a given, right? But I figure a side plank to uh, be able to create that mobility is something cool. Um, it's something that I was kind of playing around with with a, a lot of my clientele with assessments and just seeing what worked and what didn't. When I would see that uh, a range of motion was limited, we'd try and do static stretching, then we'd retest and see if there was a difference. There usually wasn't, just due to the fact that there's a lot of factors that can go into holding someone's mobility back, um, the least of which is actually muscle length. So static stretching is beneficial to a certain point, but if you actually want to see range of motion changes, then there's other considerations you have to look at. So we would do static stretching, see no benefit. We would do different static stretching, see no benefit. And then I started thinking, okay, well, instead of doing static stretching, how about we do the exact opposite end of the spectrum? Instead of stretching, let's work on contraction. Let's work on uh, stiffening the body. Let's work on tensing muscles up and see what happened there. So it was very much a concept sort of like uh, PNF stretching. You guys remember that from anatomy textbooks way back in the day, you tense a muscle in a range of motion, it releases, you get more range of motion out of it. So with this, um, I just started working on saying, okay, well, maybe there's a couple of key exercises that can produce range of motion really easily. And we do try like a front plank, a side plank, a dead bug, uh, a deep squat, that kind of stuff, and just see what happened. And consistently, the side plank seemed to work really well for hip internal rotation. Consistently, the front plank seemed to work really well for hip external rotation. I had no idea why this was happening, but I was like, okay, well, something is going on here. I got to try and figure out what's going on. Started looking more into things like uh, neurophysiology textbooks and anatomy textbooks and figuring out what was going on. And then a couple of uh, key points that I saw from people like Sue McGill or Shirley Saruman were when they talked about the concepts of core stiffness and uh, proximal stability. And they would say things like proximal stability creates distal mobility. So if you work on a core exercise and create stiffness through the core and through the spine, that tends to allow a release of restriction through things like your hips, your knees, your shoulders, to allow them to move more efficiently. And then I started wondering, okay, why is that? What's the case on that? I started to kind of piece things together as far as how the muscles and how the tissues were kind of restricting the hips in the first place and why a core exercise would help it out. And I came to the conclusion that it was kind of a, a reflexive restriction at the hip. 
So let's say that your core isn't quite firing the way it's supposed to. Your spine is very important. Your body kind of wants to protect that. So if your core is not firing up, your hip muscles will just tense up to hold a position. And that's just going to create a restriction to the range of motion. If you do core exercises to create stiffness around that spine, even if it's just a perception of stiffness, it has the reflexive ability to release some of that stiffness around the hips and allow them to move a little bit easier. So think about when you go into the doctor's office and they have you sit on the edge of the table, they whack your patella tendon with the hammer and your knee jumps up. So that's a reflexive arc. It's a reflexive condition, or not, not condition, but just reflexive stimulus where you have a shortening of a tendon and it causes a contraction of the muscle. With this, it's very much in a similar way. You create stiffness in the core and it creates a relaxation in the muscle distal to it. So when I was working with a lot of clientele and saying, okay, how do we actually create mobility? We would find way better results when we started doing things like bracing, stiffening, high tension type stuff, and that helped to create a lot of mobility in clientele way better than things like static stretching or way better than breathing drills or anything like that. You still get benefit from static stretching from breathing drills, but this just seemed to work way better and produce faster results. So I find this topic really interesting. Um, Chris Duffin talks a little bit about it in the context of your squat. So <clears throat> the idea you were saying about proximal stability um, bracing the abdomen and then allowing that to hit to so you can then hit a better squat position and it's it's not something very intuitive but it does seem to work and um, I guess that brings us on to what you were saying about static stretching and and the the length of the muscle not really being the limiting factor um, and you've written some really cool stuff on on back pain um, and I suppose it comes in similar to that the the, the biggest biggest thing was you you said that um, when people have back pain it may not be related to or like if there was some kind of structural damage from some time ago um, that may have healed up and it's now down to the threat perception and the increased density of alpha and gamma receptors in in those areas that cause the sort of hypersensitization to pain and um, so would you be able to talk about sort of back pain related for back pain that comes about from lifting and what we can do about it to improve that yeah, I mean, what you're talking about with uh, that increased sensitization, there, there's a concept in uh, a lot of pain research involving biopsychosocial aspects of things, where if the person thinks that a movement is going to hurt, they're automatically going to pre-sensitize themselves to it. So when people start thinking, oh, well, deadlifts hurt your back, and you say, I want you to do deadlifts today, they're already thinking, this is going to hurt my back. So they can actually change their movement patterns around to actually kind of feed the flame, so to speak, in terms of creating a back injury or creating the, the mechanical alignment that produces more of a risk of having a back injury. Just by the fact that they think, okay, I've got to be protected from my spine, I'm going to feel back pain. And it's almost like they kind of search out how to find that back pain. So it's kind of a, a counterintuitive aspect when it comes to lifting. Instead of having the mindset of I'm going to dominate this weight and destroy it and throw it around and all that kind of stuff, people approach it like this is going to hurt me. How do I mitigate how much it's going to hurt? So it's a very much a mindset type training when you actually get people in there, especially if they've had chronic low back pain or chronic pain in general. They, they're already in the mindset that everything is going to hurt. So they're already preparing themselves to have everything hurt versus thinking, okay, well, how can I do stuff that's not going to hurt? Even if mechanically there's no problem with it, there's no structural limitations they might have, all their x-rays and MRIs are clean, um, they just hurt all the time. And this is one of the big problems with people that have chronic pain or even just recovering from an old injury, getting them into the mindset of using it at full speed. So I mean, what, I've had a couple of clients. Uh, yeah, you go ahead. So, sorry, what, just going to say, what can someone do to um, reduce that threat perception when they're when they're coming in the gym? Blindfold. Blindfold. Yeah. Just, just don't look. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see. Your threat perception goes way down. <laughs> Actually, goes way up. But um, when you consider like getting into the gym setting, finding success is going to be the biggest thing. So finding success even with small steps is going to be huge. If you can get a person to do a hip hinge with no weight and they feel great with that, cool. Now we're going to take that exact same feeling that you just had and we're going to give you a little bit of loading with it. It's not going to be anywhere near enough to be able to cause any type of problem. Let's get you to actually get used to that problem, find success, find success, find success. The more movement success that they can find that doesn't produce the, the symptoms or the, the feelings that they have about pain, the better you're going to be. And then sometimes some movements just don't have to be trained. I mean, we were talking earlier, like, who has to swap low parallel? Well, power lifters. Who has to deadlift? Power lifters and Olympic lifters. That's it. I mean, if we can get them a similar outcome without having to force a movement that they're really hesitant about, well, we still win. 
And I want to make sure that people are in that mindset that there is no holy grail of exercise that you have to do all the time. Are deadlifts cool? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that you always have to do them. And if a person is very hesitant to do an exercise and very anxious about it, it might be better off for them to just avoid doing that exercise and find another way to do the same thing. So that really rings true with myself as well. I've, I've suffered from back pain and there is definitely a sense of apprehension before you even start a movement. You put 60 kilos on the bar and you think, this is going to be a pain. And I suppose it's, it's, it's almost, it's a bit like you've got like a mouth ulcer or something and you keep testing to see if it's painful. Um, yeah. Or you develop some kind of funky movement pattern to, to avoid the pain, the, the pain and then probably causing some other kind of issue. Yeah, and also uh, quite often people will kind of get into almost like a scanning mindset where they're, they're testing the back out all the time. It's like, yeah. how does it feel? Can I stretch it? What does it feel tight? And they're constantly moving it around and almost like they're in that OCD mindset that they have to see what's going on with their back or they might adjust their spine 50, 70, 80 times a day. You know, those people that sit and they just can't stop from popping their own spine. You know, getting people to just, you know, forget about it is huge. And I mean, it's very difficult to be able to do. It's easy enough to say, no, just forget about your lower back. Don't worry about it. But I've had my own back injuries in the past, and I got into that same mindset where you're constantly scanning, checking, doing all this kind of stuff. And it's a massive mental drain to be able to constantly be thinking of that while trying to go through the rest of your life. Absolutely. So try, yeah. So trying to get people to think of something different or trying to not think about what their back is doing or trying to not spend all day scanning it to seeing how it's standing up can be a massive way of decreasing their oversensitization to it. Okay, great. Well, I think the, the, the last thing I want to ask you, Dean, is there's something that I'm sure you've probably seen it. Brett Contreras a while ago posted a, an article about like six things you should do on a daily basis to sort of maintain your mobility. And there was like a squat in there, chest stretch, some basic stuff. Is there anything that you prescribe for you know, your average gym goer to do to sort of help with self-maintenance of, of hips, back, whatever the joint might be? Yeah, I mean, the best thing you can do for a ball and socket joint is draw circles with it. So uh, I don't know if we're just talking to you about like FRC courses or functional range condition courses with uh, Dr. Andrew Ospina. Uh, amazing, amazing instructor, talks about mobility quite a bit. He's probably coming over to London sometime soon. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to take that, take it, especially if you're a trainer, a therapist, anybody like that. But with your hip and your shoulder, they're, they're socket joints, so they're ball and socket. They, should, they have that three-dimensional movement. So ideally, you should be able to do rotational drills with those hips. You should be able to do rotational drills with your shoulders. So even if you just do a big circle with your shoulder a couple of times a day, going forwards and backwards, if you do big circles with your hips a couple of times a day, forwards and backwards. If you think about bracing your abs, bracing your glutes, relax, brace your abs and glutes, relax. Do something like a very basic cat camel stretch on hands and knees where you arch your back up and then go the other way. Just have the basic range of motion through major joints. If you can do stuff like that on a daily basis, I call that movement hygiene. It's very much like brushing your teeth. I mean, it's not something that's very intense or very involved, but Brushing your teeth helps keep your teeth happy and make sure you don't have bad breath so that nobody wants to talk to you. <laughs> Having basic movement hygiene, just taking care of your joints, means that you're going to be able to use them a lot better throughout the rest of the day and also makes it way easier for you to control things and pick up on things if they do ever start to become a problem down the road. It might have the opposite effect of people wanting to speak to you, though, if they see you doing it, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, but then you just pick and choose who you want to talk to, right? That's true. You might have might be a good screening tool to weed out the really weird people, <laughs> or it might be a bad screening tool because then really weird people want to come up and, and talk to you about it. It's like, oh, hey, you're doing thoracic mobility. I love thoracic mobility. Yeah. I don't want to talk to you. Well, okay. So you could improve, improve your friendship your friendship circle then. <laughs> so do you, do you think things like, uh, you know, couch stretch and, you know, the whole Kelly Starrett desk bound movement of, you know, for every 20 minutes of sitting, you should be couch stretching for two minutes, or I'm probably, that's probably wrong, but something like that. Do you think is that over the top for most people? Just a few basic things done on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, movement doesn't have to be very complicated. And actually, the less complicated we make it, the better it is for everyone. Um, I, I'm just a big believer in saying, you know, try to move every day, try to do something. Whether it's something that's very involved or very complicated or very specific or laser-like focus, or whether you take a shotgun approach to it and say, okay, I just want you to walk to and from work want you to bike to and from or whatever or um, just spend a couple of minutes a day doing like just an in-person dance party in your living room whatever you feel is appropriate <laughs> just being able to move your joints through ranges of motion whatever you feel good at doing 
whatever you enjoy doing. That's, that's the biggest thing. Like I could tell people do these exercises, do these programs every day, but if you absolutely hate doing them, you're not going to do them very much. If it's something that you feel really encouraged to do and you love doing and you love the process of it, I can't stop you from doing it. You're going to do it every day. So if we can find out what it is that drives the person and makes them want to do it, great. Then my job is done because now they're self-sufficient and fully engaged in what they want to do. This is no matter what happens, they'll keep that with them for as long as they want to go. That's, that's, I love that point. And it's been a refreshing chat with you in that you're sort of searching for the success, searching for the movements that you can do, looking for the function rather than just the, the dysfunction. And, and also to to do um, the movements that you love in as public a place as you can find so that you attract a really niche set of friends. Um, it's all, yeah, all really good. Um, Dean, it's been, uh, been a pleasure ch- chatting to you. Um, how can we find out more about the stuff you produce and how can we follow you? Um, the best place to look is on my website, deansomerset.com. Somerset is spelled just like the house over in London. Uh, Dean spelled just like Dean. Um, on Instagram, D- at Dean Somerset. On Twitter, I think it's Dean Somerset one I can't remember. Um, social media is weird to me. I just have no idea what's going on on it most of the time. But if you just type my name in on search engines, I'm sure you'll find it and see what's going on. Um, I've also written a lot of things on places like Team Nation, on uh, bodybuilding.com, menshealth.com. So you can check me out on those places too and see more specific examples on stuff. Excellent. We'll stick some links to all of that in the description as well. And there'll be show notes on the website as well for anyone who wants direct links. Plus Dean's uh, hip mobility sequence. Great. All right. That's everything for episode 35 of the ProPain Fitness Podcast. We'll speak to you next week.